and welcome to another edition of Rick and Bubba University, the podcast. Bubba, we had a vacation uh, last week. A lot of people caught up on Rick and Bubba Universities they may have missed. Uh, but we have a brand new one today. Scott McKay uh, is our guest, and, and Scott has has uh, been the publisher of The Hayride, an award-winning culture and politics site based out in the wonderful city of Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Uh, and uh, these guys get uh, a million views a month in online traffic. Uh, and also a very successful author. Uh, the one that kind of applies to where we are heading into this next election, Racism, Revenge, and Ruin. It's all Obama according to author Scott McKay. He is uh, probably uh, one of the most sought-after experts on the current administration, meaning the Biden administration, and what's going on here. You know, Bubba, things you and I hear from callers every single day. Uh, <laughs> and uh, Scott McKay now joins us on Rick and Bubba University, the podcast. Scott, Thanks, Scott. Welcome. welcome. Guys, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. All right, so let's just jump right in. Um, uh, right. Uh, when you know, I, I Bubba went through it with his mother. I went through it just recently with my dad, and we're talking about Alzheimer's and uh, a dementia. It's a sad, horrible thing to watch, and um, uh, it's it's, uh, it's it's terrible. And because we have been through this, uh, you know, in recent history, when we're watching the current president, we see these characteristics as clear as day. Uh, it's obvious that this man, and I'm not trying to be mean about it. Uh, as a matter of fact, we actually wanted to bring some dignity to our parents' life, and I think it's sad uh, that we're letting this go on, even the people that claim to love him. It, it is it is obvious that this man is not able mentally to do the job of the leader of the free world, commander-in-chief, and so on. So many people yeah. have theorized this is so blatantly obvious. Well, who is running the country? Who is behind this person? And you say, well, that that's not even a difficult question. And you know the answer. It's Obama. You're, you're saying we're watching yeah. Obama's uh, third term, and he's hoping to get a fourth one. Well, I, the argument might actually be whether or not this is the fourth term of Obama well, that's based right. on the fact that Trump's term was like a third term in that he ran a shadow government for those four years, right? Between the the uh, use of the, the FBI and the CIA and some of these other corrupted federal agencies um, that were countervailing everything Trump was doing. And they spent two years on an investigation of Trump's collusion with the Russians to win the 2016 election that was a lie from the very beginning. It was a, a cooked up a uh, piece of oppo quote unquote research that the Clinton campaign ginned up fed to the to the to the deep state and they used that to essentially kneecap the Trump administration and it all comes back to Barack Obama i mean this is the guy who transformed the democrat party in advance of the 2008 election you know d d swept away sort of that bill clinton new democrat remnant that was there where, you know, they were trying to move to the center as often as they could. Um, you know, and Clinton, the success that he had as president was, you know, largely after Newt Gingrich and the yeah. House Republican takeover in 1994, where he just triangulated all the stuff that Gingrich and the conservatives in the, in the Republican Party wanted to do, put his own spin on it, and then, you know, let him pass it, and then took credit for all. It. Drove Gingrich crazy. But the country ran on more or less a a centrist political agenda. And, you know, I, but despite the fact that Bill Clinton was a serial rapist uh, who abused his power all the time for things that were, you know, really pretty disgusting. The country didn't run all that poorly for those last six years that he was in office. And so, you know, the 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 theory was that, well, this is how the Democrat Party is going to become and stay relevant uh, in sort of a post-Reagan uh, kind of context. Well, along comes Barack Obama and says, no, we're going to be full-on communists. We're going to prove how much we hate this country. We're, we're, we're going to call America fundamentally racist. We're going uh, to institute a never-ending series of cultural aggressions that most Americans can't even contemplate. And we're going to use all of the 
means of power at our disposal, whether it's the you know corrupted mainstream media or the, the bureaucratic state or the courts or whatever it might be, to keep this agenda moving forward at such a speed that the other side has no way to defend against it. And when the opponents were sort of the Bush Republicans, who really didn't want to fight all that much when it came down to it. I mean, the eight years of Barack Obama, and then we've seen in the eight years since that there hasn't been a lot of, of slowdown and momentum in some of these things. I mean, I, you know, you can't even recognize America from, from 2006 or 2007. Right. Um, and race was a primary means of, of sort of splitting the country into pieces to make this easier. But by no means was it the only thing. And so with Joe Biden as the president, and I think you put it exactly right, everybody recognizes what this is. This is not somebody strong enough mentally, physically or whatever to run the country. He's clearly a figurehead. Um, and the agenda that his administration pushes is without question an Obama agenda. These are all the things Barack Obama wanted to do when he was president, but couldn't quite get there because the country wasn't ready for him. And now, you know, I mean, it got so bad. I mean, the, the latest thing we could talk about is, you know, they decided to turn Easter Sunday into the National Trans Day of Visibility. Can you imagine if I had told you back in 2006, hey, this is going to happen on, on March 31st, 2024, you would have thought I was cracked. You would have thought I was completely nuts. That will never happen in America, Scott. And guess what? That's where we are. Scott, we have been doing our radio show for 31 years at the end of this year, and we've seen a seismic shift yeah. in culture. But yeah. I, I and you had you you hit on a lot of things. I want to go back and break down. But l let me ask you an overviewing question here: If you are Obama or you are the Bidens now, that's much more left than they used to be by his own soundbite. Right. What is your end game here? Uh, do you is it just about being elected again? Uh, are you wanting the country to be? totally socialist or communist or what i mean when they wrap the big meeting up behind closed doors what what is the end game that they really want down the road that we're on the path to now we'll come back to some of these other points but give us the big right. view what what we've talked about a lot of times if i'm the king of a kingdom but the kingdom is crap what have i actually gained right well i think and there, I mean, there's a lot of ways I could answer this, but what what I would say is the people who really pull the strings behind Joe Biden, who are Barack Obama's people, generally speaking, are if you're, you're gonna if you're gonna put them in a category, I would say they're Maoists. Um, and what makes you know a Maoist a little different from a sort of ordinary uh, communist is the cultural revolution piece, right? This isn't just about trying to have the revolution of the proletariat, right? Where you're gonna have the you know, working class get all the money from the rich, all right? Like, that's like Liz Warren's game. And nobody really pays much attention to her. But the Obama crowd is all about changing the culture. And um, they've, basically settled on race as their wedge to do that. Um, and, and if you go back through Obama's history, which I do in Racism, Revenge, and Ruin, uh, you know, all of the people that mentored him coming up, both as a kid and as sort of a young adult getting into politics, they're all people who believed fundamentally that America was this irredeemably racist country uh, that needed to be you know, busted down to the to the roots and then rebuilt along a different line. And I think that that's pervasive among sort of the members of the left wing ruling class in this country. And fundamentally, that's what they want. Right. Like this is where you get DEI um, and and I mean, certainly you get ESG and some of these other things. But the race piece and the ability to use that as the wedge more so than economics um, so it's more of a cultural than an economic thing that drives these guys. I think that's the fundamental truth of the Obamas and the people that that they're with. So, you know, I like 
more people have been called racist in this country over the last 15 years than than ever before. I mean, like you didn't have this much uh, in the 50s and 60s when racism was palpable and obvious some of people. And, you know, they've got half the country scared to death of the R word being used against them. And it gives an enormous amount of power. But to answer your other question that I think is a really, really good one. I don't know that these people are motivated so much by winning elections as they are by holding power and keeping it. Um, and the, the, the example I'll use for that is the border, right? If you were super interested in winning elections um, and, and if you were the people running Joe Biden who cared about Joe Biden's political future, you would have shut that border down by now. You would have done everything that you could do to legitimately get that issue off the table, having brought in as many illegals as you needed to affect demographics and knowing that after the 2024 election, if you win, it's Katie, bar the door, you can bring everybody else you want. You would have declared a pause so that the issue would have gotten stale that Republicans wouldn't be able to talk about it. long before now. There is still no effort being made to make that border secure or orderly or whatever it might be. I mean, it is still wide open there. And it's toxic for them in their own base areas. I mean, you have got particularly black voters in the cities furious about illegal immigration and all of the migrants that have shown up in, say, Southside Chicago or New York City or some of these things. And that's going to make it hard to turn out your vote. So it's a it's definitely a negative for Biden's reelection, um, which tells me like these guys don't really care so much about 2024. What they care about is down the road when all of these migrants, kids get to 18 years old and are American citizens and are going to be able to vote. And at that point, you've got a demographic shift in the country that uh, that you know, may make the Republican Party obsolete, you know, or at least that's their intention. So I think it's about power more than it's about politics and winning elections. And that's scary to have somebody that thinks as long term as these guys do. We'll come back. We'll continue our conversation. Scott McKay, the book is Racism, Revenge, and Ruin. He takes you through the childhood uh, and, and how Barack Obama uh, became influenced to become who he is and, in his opinion, continues uh, to be a powerful force behind the scenes. When Rick and Bubba University, the podcast continues right after this. This is the Rick and Bubba Show. Watch more at blazetv.com slash Rick and Bubba. Rick and Bubba, Rick and Bubba. Scott McKay is our guest on this edition of Rick and Bubba University, the podcast. So you're, you're talking to us about Obama is still in play. We're trying to understand what is hoped to be accomplished. One of the things that when Obama went into office, and we all remember this when he was up for election, and you've already made the point, Racism is is one of their favorite plays. I, I would all of us, I think, can see that they also believe that the LGBTQ plus community can be a nice uh, uh, accent to the to the racism card. And uh, because when he ran, uh, they came up with a candidate that if you questioned him or you had anything negative to say, you weren't sticking to your ideology. You were racist. And so not yeah. only does this card become a, uh, you know, a, a sword and a weapon? It also was nicely equipped with a shield. Uh, he could be protected as well under the same exact topic of racism. Yeah, well, and to give you a little context, uh, every June, Gallup comes out with uh, a survey on race relations in the United States. Um, and in 2007, just before Barack Obama really cranked up his presidential campaign, the results of that survey showed an absolute zenith in race relations in America. Something like 74 percent across racial lines of Americans thought race relations in the country were good. Um, I mean, you couldn't touch 74 percent now, right? Yeah. So Obama comes along and people see him as a racial healer. Like this is the guy who's going to make racism and race go away as an issue in America. 
right? Like we will have finally resolved this. How right. could a racist country elect a black guy president? Well, there were people on the right, particularly, um, who had started doing research into Obama's background and were trying to raise as many red flags as possible. Hey, this guy is not a racial healer, right? Like he spent 20 years in Jeremiah Wright's church, which is a racist church and he had you know dealt with all of these people all the way back to the time he was a kid basically being mentored at the knee of frank marshall davis who was a stalinist communist russian agent during the cold war who was on the fbi's security directorate list because he was taking pictures of shorelines to set up you know help uh identify landing zones for russian and chinese armies if they ever came to hawaii right like i mean this guy was Bad, bad news. Frank Marshall Davis taught Barack Obama fundamentally that America was racist. And so you had guys like Stanley Kurtz and some of these people basically pointing all this out, laying it out very easily for everybody to understand. This guy is not a racial healer. This is a guy who absolutely hates America as founded and is going to use race in a negative way. Well, you know, that was sort of the beginning of cancel culture, really was all of the people that were trying to get that word out about Obama and how, how bad his background was on race. And nobody listened, right? It was the it was the kumbaya thing. It was the, it was, hey, we're, you know, we're electing a black guy president, because nobody really wanted it like John McCain anyway. And this will put all of this to bed. Right. No sooner does he get elected and you find out that this was the greatest bait and switch in American political history. Absolutely. Basically, on election day, you had the first of it, which was, you know, you guys remember the new Black Panther case, right? right? Like right. these two guys are standing out front of a, a polling place in South Philly with nightsticks, yeah. yelling at all the white ladies, don't you come in here and vote the black man's taking over, right? I mean, it's like the most egregious case of voter intimidation since the Klan in the 50s. And the Bush DOJ is, you know, going to prosecute these guys. Eric Holder takes office and immediately shuts all that down. And so it was like, well, that's that's not exactly what the American people thought they were voting for. But then you had the Skip Gates incident at Harvard, which was almost a comedy thing, right? Like this guy gets out of the Uber and his key doesn't work in the lock for some reason. And so he and the Uber driver are trying to beat down his front door and the cop rolls up. He's like, what's going on here, fellas? You know, and so... It ends up being Skip Gates uh, and the cop getting in a verbal altercation because it's his house. Cop doesn't know. And so you have this incident. He gets taken away for disorderly conduct or something. And it was one of these things where you kind of laugh about it, right? Because it's almost like a Steve Martin movie. Instead, Barack Obama's the cops acted stupidly. Yep. And this is part and parcel of what it's like to be black in America and all this kind of stuff. And it, you know, the, the whole country just like, oh, no, that's what we elected. And they had to walk that back with the beer summit, if y'all remember. Yeah. But then you, know, you had incident after incident after incident. The biggest one and the one I, I really focused on in the book was the Trayvon Martin thing. Oh, yeah. Right. Which yeah. was styled as this massive racial thing. And the funny part about that was there were no white people involved in the Trayvon Martin. Right. George right. Zimmerman was Colombian. Right. OK. This was a Hispanic on black thing. Right. The white people were not even involved. So they had to call George Zimmerman a white Hispanic to, to make this thing fit. Um, and nobody anywhere around the Obama camp or the Democrat Party or any of that ever said the thing that was the most important, which is, hey, don't live your life like Trayvon Martin. Right. Don't be the high school dropout. You get kicked out of school because he's a criminal and he's all messed up in drugs and he's living his life in a way that he's probably going to get killed in a drive by shooting at some point. Like nobody ever mentioned that. And every one of these incidents with police shootings or whatever it might have been, it was all about how, you know, the guy involved who was destroying his life and the life of the lives of others. Um, you know, get shot by a cop or whatever. And the shoot wasn't really even bad. And yet he's a victim. And this proves how racist and brutal the police are. And of course, this destroyed urban police departments all over America. And you ended up with a massive crime rate. 
help. And you ended up with ruined neighborhoods in these inner cities because there's no law and order, right? Well, who benefits from that? It turns out urban socialist Democrats benefit from that because when there's no law and order in your community, the economy shuts down and you become more dependent on the government all the time. And the Obama's Democrats cracked the code on that um, and, and, you know, destroyed all these cities and made the country far worse off for it. Not to mention they created a lot more racial division because the middle class all moves to the suburbs where they're governed different and you don't have the same experiences across racial economic demographic lines in this country as you had, let's say, in the 80s and 90s when this was a much more unified country. Scott, uh, I, I was having a discussion with some folks the other day that were not aware of this. And maybe you can speak to it. And it, I think it it backs your case that Obama is is the one pulling the strings with Biden. Yeah. That Susan Rice, who was the U.N. ambassador for Obama and a very close confidant, actually had an office in this White House up till about a year Wait. ago when it was outed that she had an office there. And it became, there was a story that broke that she was the pipeline. She was the go-between. And it, and it hit so hard and so quick that they moved her out almost overnight and the story went away. Yeah. Well, and if you think Susan Rice's influence over this White House has dropped off, I, I don't think that you have a full grasp of the situation. But, you know, she's one. Samantha Power is one. Um, you know, I, pretty much everybody who is... Uh, in Biden's inner circle, they're all Obama people. And and this is a little different. I mean, it's not unusual that you would have carryover, say, from one Democrat administration to, to the next or right. one Republican administration. There's always holdovers, okay? The difference here is there's not a mix. There are very few people in this, particularly in this inner circle, who are Biden's people that came up with him, that were on his Senate staff or, or, or any of that. Even the ones that were, are Obama people that, you know, like when he was vice president, they may have been his, but right. they were with Obama. The best example of this is Ron Klain, who was Biden's chief of staff as vice president. And then the first couple of years of this administration, uh, he was he was Obama's chief, or Biden's chief of staff as president. But he was an Obama guy. He was part of the inner circle of Obama's advisors. Um, and if you want proof of this, all you got to do is Google Ron Klain and Solyndra, and you'll find out, you remember the Solyndra yeah. controversy way back when, like that was a Ron Klain production. Like they went to him and he, he was the guy that made the call on Solyndra as Biden's vice presidential chief of staff. So well, that was the solar yeah, company, there's right? There's definitely yeah. that. Yeah. Um, to me, I, you know, the most dramatic example of how Obama is actually the boss of this administration is about two years old. And it's the video footage from when Obama showed up at the White House. You remember yes. that? Oh, yeah. yes. Um, yeah. Um, you know, here's Biden walking around the room and he can't even strike up a conversation with anybody. Yeah, nobody's Nobody shaking wants his to hand. Talk to him. Right. Yeah. They, yeah, they want to talk to the boss. They want to talk to Obama. And Obama's like, you know, pretends he's still the vice president and all this. I mean, it was a pathetic spectacle. The whole country's sitting there with their jaws on the floor. Like, Wait a minute. Like, who's the president? And the, you know, the obvious answer is, well, we know who the president is. He's the one everybody wants to talk to. <laughs> um, you know, they treated him as a conquering hero. And, you know, that that video made it pretty, pretty clear what was going on. But, I mean, even before that, you know, there's a quick historical factor. Barack Obama is the first ex-president to choose to live in Washington, D.C. Ever. Like all the rest of them went home after they left office. This right. guy bought a place in Calorama and there's limousines bringing people to see him every single day to talk about the politics. Um, you know, and that's unusual to say the least. But and then when you have all of his, you know, um, uh, inner circle people or Biden's inner circle people, it's a continuum. And the fact that Joe Biden kind of ran as an old school kind of moderate centrist Democrat to bring the country back to normal. And he's got the most left wing administration by far in American history. That's not Joe Biden. Joe Biden doesn't even Joe Biden's like Ron Bergen. He puts something on a teleprompter <laughs> and he reads it. He didn't even know what it is. We'll be back. We'll continue our conversation with Scott McKay when Rick and Bubba University, the podcast continues right after this. 
Mother's Day is almost here. And the moms on your list, have you thought about getting them Raycon's Everyday Earbuds? Um, Let me tell you, uh, mom's got a lot on her. And the good thing about these earbuds, and and they are just phenomenal. Our audience is raving about them. If mom needs a break from the day-to-day grind, one of the best ways she could do that is go to the isolation mode. You can have the awareness mode if you need to know what's going on around you. But if mom has got everybody taken care of and she wants to take a break, she can go to her favorite podcast, like Rick and Bubba University, the podcast. She can put on the isolation mode, and she can truly relax and just shut the outside world away and just spend time relaxing and listening to what she wants to listen to. It's a great idea. Uh, they are perfect, uh, and the audio quality rivals all the big audio brands that you know and love, but at a price that even mom will feel good about. Uh, believe me, check out the tens of thousands of five-star reviews. The Raycons that, that we have in our house, we use them uh, practically every day. Uh, the, the sound profiles are great. I told you about the isolation mode or the awareness mode, 32-hour battery life, eight hours of playtime, uh, and about half the price of the other premium audio brands, the uh, earbud tap function, uh, also the customizable um, uh, gel tips, uh, comfortable fit. They won't fall out even if you're being active or exercising. Get yours right now and get some for mom by going to buyraycon.com slash Pod. Do that today and get 20% off your Raycon order, plus free shipping. That's right, 20% off and free shipping. Go to buyraycon.com slash rickbubbapod, buyraycon.com slash rickbubbapod. Scott McKay is our guest on this edition of Rick and Bubba University, the podcast. His book, Racism, Revenge, and Ruin, It's All Obama, and today he is saying, not holding back at all, Joe Biden, we all know, is not in charge. It's still Obama and his group that is running this country. Scott, we we talk a lot about the president's mental status, which, the, again, mm. those of us who've dealt with it, it's very clear. Uh, we've come a long way from Dan Quayle misspelling potato, hadn't we? Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, those were the days, right? <laughs> um, well, and, of course, I guess you could... If you want to compare apples to apples, you can go from Quail to uh, Kamala Harris. Yeah. Um, which you know, I guess I could, I could, I could offer up some real smart ass commentary. Her, <laughs> but <laughs> I'll, I'll leave that for now because everybody already knows she loves school uh, buses. Yeah, I know that this is not a this is not a particularly uh, intellectually driven administration. I'd say. Do do you think though, Scott, that it's so? Did they expect it to be this bad? I mean, if if you're trying to do what you're pointing out, they're clearly doing. Did they miscalculate? Yeah. How, did Obama not get his first pick right, as yeah. VP that was going to come back and be president? Uh, did they have somebody else in mind? It didn't work out. Well, I you know I think they they wanted Biden because Biden was a guy that was plugged into the sort of D.C. establishment. Uh, he would make Obama more palatable and allow him to sort of infiltrate that crew. Uh, and, you know, and Joe Biden just wanted to, I mean, like, you know, he's a, a dog you give a bone to. Like, he, I mean, Biden wasn't going to rock the boat in that administration. Um, I don't think they wanted to make Biden, uh, you know, the, the successor. I, I think that, that, you know, sort of the deal was caught with Hillary Clinton. And uh, and so, you know, she had her turn and the, the real problem was when she didn't. Win. Um, and then they had to come back to somebody. And I think they wanted Kamala. Yeah. I mean, they went out and raised a bunch of money for Kamala Harris at the beginning of the 2020 cycle. Um, and like she was, if you'll remember, I mean, she was sort of the, the, the chosen one. And then she took to the campaign trail and it really didn't work. Right, like yeah. it's so yeah. I mean, she like she attacked Biden pretty hard in oh, the yeah, debates. I mean, man, she, she, oh, she yeah, basically yeah, called him a racist. And I mean, you know, a racist. Yeah. That was yeah, that was the best rhetoric that she had in the whole the whole thing was you know how racist uh, Joe Biden was. Um, but the problem was like she just didn't offer anything. She's like very much like that first round draft pick quarterback that you put on the field and all he does is throw interceptions and it's like. Okay, this is really not going to work, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, and so she had to drop out, and you know. But the thing was it, it, that 2020 Democrat primary is so instructive as as to what we're talking about. 
Because remember, they had two dozen candidates. Yeah. And arguably the least impressive two of that two dozen were Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. And they ended up being number one and number two on the ticket. And the only real rational way to explain that was that those are the two puppets for the Obama machine. Yeah. Um, you know, they, they couldn't trust what Tulsi Gabbard would do, and they couldn't trust Liz Warren. They certainly couldn't trust Bernie Sanders, who has his own, you know, organization and machine and, and you know, grifting thing that he does. Um, you know, and so like this was what this was what this whole thing was set up as. Yeah. Now the problem with is this, and it's a sort of a long term historical okay. thing, which is political machines are very, very difficult to maintain and sustain. Um you know, the most successful political machine in American history and maybe the world history was Tammany Hall. And that was a local thing in New York. Um, and it only really lasted about 30, 35 years. A national political machine is almost impossible to keep going longer than 15 or 20 years because it takes a ton of money, which they have. But it also takes a lot of talent. And the problem with the Obama machine is the talent was all front loaded, Right. It was not just Obama, but like the other people that were with him, David Pluffs and the Axel Rods and, and those kind of folks. They all went off to make a lot of money. And when they come out, you have to replace them with with people as talented or more talented. And they didn't because the, the, the crew that's running the show now is like the B and C and D team from the Obama machine initially. And they're just not capable of keeping this thing going. And that's, you know, it, that's a problem for at the candidate level. It's also a, a problem at the sort of organizational and staffing. Level. And so this like this thing just doesn't work. Scott, now, well, let, that, let me, that sounds hopeful. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, no, I want to ask you in, in that same vein, they can't be happy that Biden is polling like he is now and looks mm -hmm. as lost as he does in public. So what are yeah. they going to do? Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Can, can they well, replace him? Yeah. Who is the heir apparent? Do they go to uh, Newsom or somebody younger, a generational now, candidate? Now, we've all heard Michelle, but uh, is that even conceivable? Yeah. Well, I think I think if they could get Michelle parachuted in on top of that ticket, I think they would do it. I think there's two problems with Michelle. Number one, she's not about the work. Right. OK. I mean, Michelle Obama likes to take vacation. She doesn't like to actually run anything. Um, and she proved that the last time they gave her a job back in Chicago, which she would run on this initiative that was all about keeping poor people from, away from the University of Chicago's hospital and shooing them off the private you know, little clinics in Southside uh, Chicago. So they paid her three hundred thousand dollars. She barely showed up for work. To do that. Um, and then ultimately ended up getting disbarred, I think. As a result. Um so she's not about the work. And then the other problem with her is that, like, you can't tell her what to do. And so she doesn't want it. And I guess they probably keep asking her. And at this point, it looks like they've basically given up on that. The problem with Newsom is that Newsom's ego is bigger than Obama's. And so he's like nobody's puppet. And you have to be an Obama puppet if you're going to be the nominee in 24. So, like, the two most prominent names that you could throw out there kind of don't fit with this. And they may actually be stuck with Biden. And if Biden ends up taking a complete bad turn, uh, they might be stuck with Kamala, which means winning this election starts to become very, very difficult for them. And like this is where I was going uh, right before you, you jumped in with the, this last question is that should be a hopeful thing. Right. Like we should be looking at this saying, OK, well, you know, 2024 is going to be a good cycle for the Republicans. Mm -hmm. Going to have an opportunity to roll some of this stuff back and maybe get the country back to normal. But the one like defining characteristic of the Obama machine is these people do not admit defeat. When things start going wrong for them, what they do is they escalate. Right. And this is why you saw like when the, the January 6th protesters showed up. The response to that was to militarize the Capitol with razor wire and National Guardsmen and then put everybody in jail that was even a mile away from the Capitol at the time. And then there was the lawfare against Trump 
and all of these other things. And so the question is, well, what's next if none of that stuff works? And I don't have a good answer for you on that. What I can say is, is you can't really leave anything um, uh, you know, off the table because they are that ruthless and they've proven it again and again. We'll come back. We'll finish our conversation with Scott McKay when Rick and Bubba University, the podcast, continues right after this. This is the Rick and Bubba Show. Watch more at blazetv.com slash Rick and Bubba. Rick and Bubba, Rick and Bubba. All right, so we, we've got we got just a few more minutes uh, with Scott McKay. We have really laid out, uh, if you read the book, you Racism, Revenge, and Ruin, it's all Obama. You do see, and he's been 100% right, we watched it out, we, we saw it here on the show. We said over and over on the show when things started going the direction they started to go with Obama actually being the president, we said on the show, you've just said it, Scott McKay, you say it in the book, he never hid from us who he was. People were screaming, this is not going to be the salve on race relations that some of the Americans think. And you're right. I heard it everywhere. I'm voting for Obama. No, nobody can ever call me racist again. No one can ever call our country racist again. It was grossly a miscalculation, but it wasn't hid from us who he was. Then, of course, he became the, the shield is if you said those kind of things, you were racist, not sticking to principles or ideology. He was a different deal from Bill Clinton uh, because he came from that Saul Alinsky and Mao and all this you were telling us about. It was a different Democratic Party. America must be punished, and sh everything that we've accomplished is ill-gotten gains, and off we went. And you're saying this this push to completely change the culture uh, is continuing, and all we see right now are puppets in Biden and Kamala Harris. And uh, and then Bubba's asked the question, and you you tried to answer it. What are they going to do? Since it looks like these two can't do it, you don't really know that answer. The the obvious choices either won't do the work, or they're too much ego and won't be controlled. But is, is the answer, because everybody is, we hear it on the show, will Trump save us again? Is that enough? What's going to happen, Scott? Well, uh, I think that if we have a reasonably honest presidential election in 2024. That's a big if. Fall, <laughs> yeah, that is the if. I think if, the, I think if this thing is, has some integrity to it, particularly when you have RFK Jr., uh, running as a third party candidate. And you've got a couple other ones uh, um, potentially in the race as well or or in the race, depending on whether the, how many states they get on the ballot. You know, Cornell West is a is a I mean, Cornell West is a bad, uh, a bad thing to happen to Joe Biden because he's got a lot of contacts. And I mean, this is a guy who's a, a prominent academic at Princeton who has been going around the black churches, uh, giving talks for decades, right, and has a very big following in, in the black community and could very well siphon off a couple percent of the vote that is all Biden's vote. I mean, like, that would be a, a total killer for Biden in a Wisconsin or a Michigan or a Pennsylvania, okay? So you have, like, the potential of third-party candidates making it so that Biden can't get more votes than Trump. The question then becomes, okay, we already know that they're willing to do, um, you know, irregular things to win an election, right? We saw that in 2020 with the mail-in votes and, and the ballot harvesting and all of these things that weren't necessarily, I mean, I think there were illegal things done within them, but the practices themselves are bad form to run an election, but not necessarily illegal things. Um you know, how far into the realm of illegal are they willing to go to uh, Jimmy this election in their favor? And if that is no longer possible, you know, what else might they do? And you know, because these are people who are not bound by traditional constitutional America. In fact, they hate traditional constitutional America. They've done everything they could to subvert traditional constitutional America. And instead, what you hear all the time from these guys is something they call our democracy, oh, right? Yeah. Like everything is a threat to our democracy. Oh, yeah. That's a code word, all right? That is 
that you know our democracy is COVID lockdowns and and the deep state and social media censorship and all of these different things that you know are kind of creeping into mainstream consciousness of well I guess that's just how things run now right one of the reasons I wrote racism revenge and ruin is to point out and sort of beat people over the head with the fact that look none of this is sort of organic societal evolution all right this stuff was all contrived and executed it's man-made America doesn't naturally look like this it looks like this because people have been making it like this which means it can be unmade if there are enough people out there willing to to drag us back to you know whatever the 80s and 90s when we had sort of a more unified culture and, and a more patriotic America um, and, a, and a more successful America, as, as a matter of fact. But I mean, that can be done, but you have to understand who's doing to us what's right. being done right now. And it's the Obama machine. And, you know, Obama personally is in. And like that has to be understood and it has to be active. Scott, you, you mentioned the vote uh, and, and we only got a few minutes left, but we all felt like something yeah. wasn't exactly right in that election, but we never produced prosecutable evidence. What, what, right. where did that fall short? What happened? What, what, what created that gap? Well, I, I think it's just, I think it's really, really hard to get ironclad proof of um, election shenanigans and interference, right? Because pretty much all of the votes that, that would have won, say, a Georgia, right? All of that is in Fulton County where Democrats control the entire thing, okay? And if you control soup to nuts, the entire apparatus of vote counting and all of these other things, it's not hard to make it so that if somebody comes and investigates this thing, they can't find a smoking gun that proves you know, what you're saying. And when you don't have a media that's willing to entertain these things as a real conversation to have, when like every single news report on the aftermath of the 2020 election is, you know, Donald Trump falsely accuses uh, so and so of stealing an election, like that was all you heard, right? Like the news, you could not, you could not get an honest discussion in the legacy corporate media about the quality of the vote counting and the process of that election when it was clearly irregular. And if you're not going to have the kind of constant pressure that a media uh, scrutiny of something like this or a, um, you know, a state legislature that's going to hold, you know, hearing after hearing after hearing into what some of these things were. And you had a lot of Republicans at the state legislative level that just didn't have the stomach to take this on. Um, and so you had sort of fleeting investigations and you never really proved anything. And this thing just got hard. And so it just sort of went away. And, you know, I, I say this all the time. If you don't impose consequences on bad behavior, the bad behavior gets worse and you get consequences. They just don't fall on the bad actors. They fall on everybody. And so now we don't have any confidence that an election at the federal level is going to be held with any integrity at all, because we've already seen that it's pretty possible that you're not going to have any election integrity. And so. You know, that actually benefits the Democrats. Their people don't care. I think Rasmussen about a month and a half ago <laughs> puts out a survey of basically wealthy white leftists, 63 percent of whom said it was better to cheat than to lose an election. OK, like they're perfectly good having a sham election. Our people get so demoralized by a sham election that they don't show up. Right. So like who wins in that deal? It's like. It, it's a it's a heads I win tails you lose type of situation for the Democrats, and so a lot of this is just you know look you've got to overwhelm the other side you got to beat them by twelve points because you can't fix that election it's it's too much and the people you're going to ask to do the work to fix it will be like if I do that we're going to lose anyway and I'm going to go to jail right <laughs> um, and so all of a sudden you can't fix it that's the election that this has to be. Um, and it, it depends on Trump running a great campaign. It depends on the RNC finally giving party support to Republican candidates the way Democrats do theirs. Um, and it depends on an American people that's so pissed off about what we've seen over the last 15 years that, you know, it doesn't even matter that Trump is the candidate. 
It's about throwing these bums out. It's about killing this Obama machine and, and moving past it and tossing it into the ash heap of history so that we can you know, go on about the business of res- you know, what I'd say reviving the country. So there you go. Um, and so, you know, That's I don't it. know if we have what we need to make that happen, but it's what needs to it needs what needs to be done. Scott McKay, thank Scott, you so much. Thank you so Thanks much. Thanks for being with Great us. Great insight. Yeah. Love it. Racism, revenge, and ruin. It's all Obama. It's available wherever you get books. Pick up a copy today and listen to the last thing he said. If you if there's any chance in this upcoming election, it has to be an overwhelming response right. against this administration. Thanks for being with us on this edition of Rick and Bubba University, the podcast. Mm-hmm.